Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode 90 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Jack Chappell. Jack graduated from the University of Southern California and worked as a newspaper reporter at a regional newspaper in coastal Orange County, California, until he was drafted for service during the Vietnam War. He chose to enlist so he could attend officer candidate school and served on active duty for two years between 1970 and 1972 as a lieutenant in the infantry. After leaving active duty, he returned to journalism and covered the Western White House during the Nixon administration. From there, he went on to work for the University of California in public communications, eventually retiring as vice chancellor for advancement. He now continues to work as a freelance writer. Jack is also the son of Howard Chapel, an OSS officer who served in northern Italy during the final year of the Second World War. Howard's story is told in the book The Brenner Assignment by Patrick O'Donnell. I invited Jack onto the podcast after we met in person last fall at Arlington National Cemetery during the unveiling of the OSS Memorial in Section 2 of the cemetery. But before we get into this story of but before we get into this amazing story of the OSS operations in northern Italy, I want to ask you, the listener, a question. Has this podcast given you a renewed interest in the history of the Cold War? Do you want to share that interest with others? Well, now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-Minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game. With the two expansion packs currently available or using the brand new Complete Edition, up to 10 players can battle each other for global domination. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, use your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Penkovsky weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing, just learn the color codes and point values of each card. My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won several rounds against her mom and I. You can also use the new speed tokens to boost the rate of play by up to 50% for large multiplayer games for when the Cold War turns hot. If you've heard me mention 15-minute Cold War before, there are two brand new updates you should know about. Starting now, any order for more than $50 gets free worldwide shipping. And if you use the discount code SPYCRAFT101, you'll get 15% off your entire order. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15mincoldwar.com. And make sure to follow at 15 Minute Cold War on Instagram. Jack, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Yes, I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. I'm glad. I know that we've been planning this for more than six months now. I think it was October that we first met, and here it is late March now. Absolutely. But good things take time. Yeah, certainly did. In the meantime, I finished the book, The Brenner Assignment. I know we're going to dive into that in a few minutes. And it was it was quite a ride, as I'm sure you're aware, and I'm sure people are about to find out themselves. But, you know, Jack, I've read many, many books over the past couple of years, in particular about World War II history, Cold War history, that sort of thing. And Brenner Assignment, it really, really stayed with me. It was quite a roller coaster for the people involved, including your father. So I'm very happy to get the chance to share that story with more people now. Well, good. I look forward to helping out with that. <laughs> Terrific. So you grew up with your father, of course, and the book didn't come out until just a few years ago. So growing up, how much did you actually learn about what your own father did during the war? Sure. Well, like a lot of post-war babies and part of that baby boom, our dads didn't talk about things they did in the war. They closed that page to their life and they went on. And so you have, in my father's instance, the first son in a, a blue-collar family in Cleveland, Ohio. His father was a letter carrier and mom had been a nurse, but she was a German immigrant and had 
become a nurse. And then when the kids came along, she became a mom and took care of the family and, and such. So they, they survived four kids and the family on a U.S. Postal Service letter carrier salary. So dad was very active, however, in athletics. He went to Case Western Reserve, and then he went to Ohio State, where he was something of a football star. And so when the war came, he enlisted. Shortly after enlisting, he signed up for Officers Candidate School, and he was graduated from Officers Candidate School and commissioned in June of 42, I believe. And then he went to Fort Benning, where he was in the Airborne. He got his Airborne wings and then stayed on as an instructor there. And the stories about my dad as an instructor in Fort Benning at the Parachute School are absolutely legend. Then in May of 44, he went to Africa. He was dispatched to Africa. He had joined the OSS in 43. And he went to Africa. He had been dis determined to be the commander of the German operations group, and he was waiting an assignment to go into Germany with an OSS group, but that never came, just as the way the war, the war was going at that time. So he talked himself into being assigned to the Italian operations group, and he parachuted into northern Italy. Well, all of that is stuff that I've learned. I didn't know any of that when I was growing up. I didn't even know that he was a war hero. After the war, he joined the Federal Narcotics Bureau, and I did know that he was a very first-rate narcotics agent and took down members of the cartel and the mafia. We led exciting lives as, as children of a narcotics agent who worked undercover. Hmm. I, I remember you mentioning that, but that's not a part of the book, Brenner Assignment, at all. But that is something that you grew up with. So can you talk a little bit about that? What was so exciting about being the child of an agent? Was it the locations that you wound up in, or were there threats to the family from some of the cartels or anything like that at all? Well, we moved around a lot because he would work undercover, and once his cases were made, then we'd move to another location. So my mom, who was an absolute saint and a very strong personality in her own right, said that we'd had 11 houses in 12 years. And we finally settled in Anaheim, California when I was 11 years old. We lived there. I stayed there then for the rest of my school time. But during that time, we would have witnesses stay at our house awaiting trial or other things. And so you've got to meet the meet people who are of unsavory nature and savory nature i guess as well my father got into a an altercation with sort of a celebrity gangster named mickey cohen in 56 and cohen came up to his office in the federal building in la and accused my dad of trying to set him up on a drug deal and dad started said, no, I didn't do that. But Mickey took a swing at him. So they had to bring the carpenters into my father's office to repair the wall from where oh Mickey's face hit it. And after that, we had federal agents that accompanied us to school for a while until things kind of calmed down. So. Hmm. Wow. His adventures did not stop when the war ended then, clearly. No, they they didn't. There, there are Howard Chapel stories out there, that's for <laughs> sure. I can tell. I can tell. It sounds like there should be a whole. Is actually, is there anything else written extensively about his post-war career, and is he the subject of any other books besides the Brenner assignment? He is. There's one uh, addresses his narcotics operations, and it's called yeah. Strength of the Wolf. Okay, I'm going to have to read that one after this, then, for sure, because okay. I, I only know very little, honestly, about his career. And I have to tell you, Jack, I haven't really read very much about the mob in the past, but I do know the name Mickey Cohen. Certainly, I think almost anybody would, as a matter of fact, who've studied that period of history. And I've also seen a photo of your father that you sent me, the one where General Donovan is pinning the award on him. And just from the look of it, your father is about the last guy I would ever take a swing at. But I guess Mickey was braver than a lot of people. Well, it's interesting. I interviewed Mickey Cohen afterward, after he got out of prison from the IRS, from the income tax evasion charges. And so I 
That's when I was reporting. And so I interviewed Mickey. I was working on a story about a family in Southern California who was very well to do, but one of the one of the brothers got in trouble with a mob in, in Vegas. Anyhow, and so Mickey and my dad had become friends. And so I talked with Mickey about this fellow that I was interested in. And when Mickey talked about my dad, he says, yeah, I took a swing at him when he was sitting down and he started to get up and he got up and he kept getting up and then he got up some more. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, well, I can just imagine that. Man, quite a guy, quite a guy. Amazing. So since you mentioned that you did the interviews, were you yourself interviewed for Patrick O'Donnell's book during his research phase? No, I met Patrick afterward, but I wasn't interviewed by Patrick. Okay. I was wondering if maybe you had some like you know, family heirlooms, you know, like a diary or anything like that, or his old uniform, anything like that, that might shed some light. But I, the, the book is so well researched and well documented that it seems like he found everything he needed. I, I think so. Patrick is a great researcher. And frankly, we didn't keep a whole lot of that stuff because we moved around so often. There wasn't a, a treasure trove of uniforms or things like that, that, that moved with us. We were really peripatetic family and just moved. And so no, there wasn't anything like that. Hmm. And dad didn't keep a diary. I do have some of his old papers and old things like that, but not a diary. Hmm. I see. That That's unfortunate that a lot of stuff wasn't saved like that, but totally understandable. If you are moving every single year, you'd certainly want to pare it down to the bare minimum if you could. So tragic, but understandable, certainly. Yep. We moved so often that we kept the moving boxes. <laughs> I mean, we never got rid of moving boxes. Oh my so. goodness. Hmm. That's something that seems a little more common these days for people, but I didn't expect it as much then, but I guess that's the life of a narcotics agent at the time. So for how many years was he a narcotics agent? Let's see. He left the bureau. Well, he joined in 47 and he left the bureau in 62. Hmm. So and he left the Bureau because he'd been given a requirement that he be transferred again to another location. And if I remember correctly, he had the option of going back to New York or going to Mexico City or going to Rome. And at that point, his kids, my brother and I and sister, were all of an age where we didn't want to, to relocate. We'd, they'd left us too long in one place, and we grew roots. Mm-hmm. Understandable. So what did he do after that, after 1962? Mm -hmm. He had become friends with Mayor Yorty in Los Angeles. And so he was on a number of boards and things at, and had a number of other friends who were, were influential with Mayor Yorty. So he joined the, he was commissioned, he was appointed to the Public Works Commission for the city of Los Angeles. And so he was a commissioner there and then eventually selected the president of the Board of Public Works. So interestingly, it was under his direction to develop business for the city of Los Angeles that the whole Century City area was started, conceived, and and moved ahead with. So it sounds I'm, – I'm surprised by that, honestly. I mean it sounds like he really left his mark in so many different ways on life. He did, absolutely. That's amazing. So he, correct me if I'm wrong, he passed away, away about 15 years ago. Is that right? Yes. In 2007, he was 88. Okay. My gosh. That was a life, a full life lived, certainly. And then the book came out a number of years after that. So you learned all of this, this whole other chapter of his life years after he had passed away, I guess? Much of it I did. There was another book that had come out earlier, sort of a compendium of World War II spies and such called secrets and spies and it was really just a behind it builds itself as a behind the scenes stories of world war ii and i'd read some of that and there was another one called cloak and dagger that came out immediately after the war and that one had one of his stories as well hmm. some of his stories now, i'd read cloak and dagger but the others i've kind of accumulated as i've been an adult I see. I see. Yeah. Slowly putting the pieces together over years and years. So would you say that the Brenner assignment then is 
like the most complete picture of his work, or is there some other stuff that people should read as well if they want to get the full story? No, the Brenner assignment is absolutely the most complete. And part of that is due to the really diligent work of the author who spent an enormous amount of time with the person who was the commander for the Italian OSS operations. And that fellow's name is Al Matarazzi. And Al has passed on now. But Al was a good friend of my dad's. And even though Al was in Washington and we were in California, I know my dad would talk to him on the phone once a week, once a month, something like that. Hmm. Well, that research really paid off because it is quite a book, like I said. So let's go ahead and and dive into that a little bit if we can. So you already mentioned your father, his pre-war life, and then his train up for his mission there. And your, your father is kind of one half of the book, honestly, as I'm sure that you are well aware and anybody who's read it is well aware. There's also this Captain Stephen Hall, right. I believe, who is a major portion of the book. And I don't know how much you know about him because you just read the book after it came out. But is there anything you can tell us a little bit about his story at all? You know, I, I know about Captain Hall only superficially. But one of the things that comes to mind is here are two people who have raised, two men who have been raised in completely different circumstance. Hall, I believe, was an Ivy Leaguer. And my dad was just a a blue collar guy. And it speaks to what individuals can do when they're faced and when they're part of an overwhelming sort of set of circumstances, a war. And so two people who probably wouldn't have come to know each other in other circumstances were thrown together. They had an objective, and that was to defend their nation and to fight at an at a absolute visceral level where they put their lives. It's a cliche to say that you put your life on the line, but that is what, I mean, you are doing that very thing, and you fight for those things that you believe in. And so I saw that in Hall when I was reading about him and the day-to-day things that he had to go through, as well as those things that I read more closely about my dad, fighting somebody and breaking their neck with your bare hands, that sort of thing, slicing the throats of people that were a threat to you and that you, you absolutely had to get past. You had to get rid of them, if you will. And so... That nature, and and these are people who are, you know, you would meet them in everyday society, and yet when they have to, to work hard to defend their nation, that is what they're willing to do. We'll be right back. Hello, nerds. Come listen to the History Nerds United podcast, and let's make history fun again. We interview today's best authors, whether they are established Pulitzer Prize winners or someone debuting their first book. Let us show you that history is not a boring class you took in high school, but a place where the best stories come from. And we don't just cover history. We also love to chat about true crime, biographies, memoirs, and so much more. So head on over to History Nerds United and let us introduce you to your new favorite book and learn the story behind the story. History Nerds. Absolutely. Absolutely. These guys were such a, a rare breed. And I know that that's been said many times. Of course, they're called the greatest generation for a reason. But the more that I dive into these stories, because I've covered OSS personnel, OSS activities a number of times on previous episodes. Right. And every one of these guys is just more incredible and iconic than the last. Honestly, I mean, truly, a you know, once in a millennia kind of collection of people is, is what it feels like when you read their stories. There is one thing about Hall that stood out to me right at the beginning. And actually, I want to read a super quick passage from Brenner Assignment because of the insight that it gave. But I don't know if you recall from the book, but he wanted to join the OSS as soon as he heard. So he simply wrote a letter. Mm -hmm. I believe he was already in the Army and he wanted to transfer over to the OSS from his current assignment because he knew that there would be operations in northern Italy. He was 
he had spent time in Northern Italy in the past. He knew how to climb mountains and that sort of thing. And he felt like he was a good fit for the mission. And we know now that he was, Mm -hmm. but before he joined, he sent this letter to the OSS and there is a line in that letter. I'm going to read it right now. He's just talking about all of his abilities and everything. And at the very end of this letter, he goes on to explain his own marital status, essentially. And he says, personal situation, unmarried, ready to go anytime under any circumstances that augur success. And Jack, I tell you that, that line right there, ready to go anytime under any circumstances that augur success, that one, it really just hit me like a lightning bolt when I read it. Yeah. And it set an incredible tone for these men and for the book as well. So I was, you know, glued to my seat, honestly, right from the beginning with the story. Yeah. And in my dad's case, he was supposed he was there waiting and waiting and waiting, which was probably a month and a half to three months, something like that, in northern Africa to be sent into Germany as the operations group commander for a German operation. And he got tired of waiting. And so he literally talked himself into being assigned to the Italian operations group so that he could get into the war because he wanted to. Mm-hmm. He wanted to to fight on behalf of his nation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of people will sign up, plenty of people will volunteer, plenty of people do their duty, but it's a fairly small percentage that will actively seek out that level of danger that those guys were in because, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have 150 of their fellow unit members, fellow teammates with them, you know, like so many others would right. in the war because they went in in small teams and occupied territory, you know, very little chance of rescue as many of them learned, unfortunately over the years. So yeah, just amazing. And both of these guys put themselves out there and they left their mark. They left their mark on the war in a big way and in very different ways as well, but it really is amazing. And the whole first half of the book kind of is, is more about Hall because he got in so much earlier. And I kept wondering to myself, you know, what's going to happen with Chapel? Because I know he's a big part of this book and he's kind of languishing away, you know, in Northern Africa and at airborne school and that sort of thing. But, you know, once he got in it, he, he certainly got yes. in it. No question about it. Well, it also, I think, shows the impact that indiv- an individual person can have on the course of the war. Not I don't mean to overstate the role that my dad had, but the bridges that were that were targeted in the Brenner Pass, it was essential to to stop the Germans who were in Italy, and there were thousands and thousands of German troops and German equipment in Italy that because they'd had to occupy the country because the fascists, the Italian fascists, could not really hold it. And so the Nazis went in to occupy the country. And so they had this enormous commitment of men and materiel in Italy. Well, when the, the war changed, suddenly all those people were being recalled to, to Germany so that they could fight and to, could stall the allies coming across from Normandy, from and coming across from from France. And so they were being recalled to protect the fatherland. And the more that could be kept down in Italy and out of that war, the easier it was going to be, not easy, but the less difficult it would be for the allies coming across and through France, and then finally to, to secure Germany. And so you think of, one bridge or two bridges in a pass. Well, there's a a note in Secrets and Spies about how blowing up those four bridges or three bridges caused the Germans to leave all of this equipment and they're just to be, to try and get across the one remaining bridge to get back through the Brenner Pass caused this enormous backup and it kept people trapped down in Italy where they were where they surrendered to the American forces coming up from the south of Italy. And so yes, a small group of people, one person can have an enormous impact on a huge endeavor. Hmm. Yeah, they really can and they really did as well. So since we've mentioned the Brenner Pass so many times, can you talk about it a little bit more? I mean, what was its significance or why was it so significant to 
the troop movements in the course of the war? Was it like the only pass that was passable at that at that time? At you know during the the winter of forty four, sure. as an example. Well, we tend to think of of spaces in American terms. We tend to think of geography in American terms, and we've got miles and miles of miles and miles in America, and that's not the case in in Europe, Austria and Italy and Switzerland and Germany all come together at this one point. They're not, not directly together, not like a star together, but they are within a few hundred miles of each other. And the access way for these countries is through the Brenner Pass, through the Alps, through the Dolomites, which are a young the Dolomites are a young mountain range in terms of mountains, and they are very, very jagged. They, they're, they look like, and, and sometimes they're called the dragon's teeth because they're so sharp. And so movement, it's not like going through the, the Appalachian Mountains. It's, it's not like driving through the Rocky Mountains now. It's the pathways that are going through the Alps and the Dolomites are thousands of years old, and they remain the only ways to get through that particular geography. And so that's what happened. The bridges that had been built over time were used and used and used and redone and redone. You can go back. The bridges that Dad blew up have been repaired, and they're using them now in the same general location. I was fortunate, I've been back, to, or I've been to Northern Italy a number of times, sometimes retracing my dad's steps, sometimes just enjoying Italy, but it's, it's an amazing land. And when you look out across it, it's hard to imagine that it could be in such incredible, breathtaking turmoil with horrible, horrible things happening. I think I mentioned to you one of the visits that I made was I was walking in downtown Belluno, which was sort of at the center point of all of this activity that the OSS was involved with in my dad's operation Tacoma. And it was a Sunday afternoon and it was a beautiful day. And there was a an organ grinder there, literally an organ grinder in costume with a monkey and going around and taking pennies from children. And there was other groups that were just enjoying a wonderful day. And the Italian that I was with he was showing me around and he said, and that post right there, that is where they hung my uncle hmm. because he had been nice. caught doing something that the Germans didn't like. There's another village nearby where an entire family was executed because someone had found some American cigarettes in their trash. And in fact, they had been covering an American downed pilot. They had been keeping him for a while in his journey to try and get through Yugoslavia and out into safety. And so they executed the entire family. So oh, no. you, you're struck by the beauty of the area, but also by the, the history that is there. And it's just, you know, it's an amazing trip. I'll, I'll bet. I'll bet it is. And I, I mean, I have been to Europe in the past. I haven't been in the past couple of years after I really started studying all of this extensively, but I've got tons of locations now that I've got saved because of the significance of the events there. And it looks like nothing more than a touristy little street corner you know, to people that haven't read up on it before they arrive, but, you know, tremendous significance all over the place there. And I have to assume that the Brenner Pass, because of the geography there, was probably militarily significant many, many, many times over the past couple of millennia. Yes. Yep. I would imagine so. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Hall dropped in and he had um, met up with the Italians. He did speak some Italian, I know, and he was in some ways, he was kind of on his own on this mission, and he has quite an incredible story of his own before your father even made it into Italy. Do you know very much of that? I mean, did he ever meet your father before they 
actually both wound up assigned to Northern Italy, to your knowledge? I don't believe so, no. Okay, I know that they were not necessarily in communication, but they were connected in terms of like the chain of command and all that. And they were, your father was assigned to go in there and help him, but it, you know, didn't work out with the fog of war and the communications breakdowns and all that. So can you talk a little bit about what Stephen Hall was doing to the best of your knowledge prior to your father actually making it into country? That's a hole in my knowledge. It really is. And something that I should, I should reread the book and with the objective of reading it absolutely thoroughly rather than skipping through some parts and reading about your dad. <laughs> so but I think that's the natural thing to do. So I wish, I wish I were more helpful about Stephen Hall. Sure, sure, sure. No, don't worry about it. And, you know, don't tell my previous guests, but I have had to skip around a couple of times when I was pressed for time with an interview coming up soon. But Stephen, I mean, he had his own set of adventures, yep. essentially on his own, sometimes with the partisans. But I was amazed through the book at how much of the time that he, as an OSS officer in uniform, was totally and completely on his own, trekking through the mountains, trekking through, I guess, the Dolomites there with Germans hunting him and he was just a very, very good mountaineer and a very, very brave, essentially foolhardy guy because he was able to stay one step ahead of them through tremendous hardship, trying to meet up with these partisans, trying to make it you know, to these bridges that needed to be blown up and that sort of thing. And he had you know, some success, some failures. Not everything worked out like the, they wanted to, especially with the various groups of partisans there, you know, which were kind of at odds. We've talked about that on the podcast. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silent's lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. a little bit before, but the Italian partisans were not a a single unified group by any means. There were socialists, there were fascists, there were anti-fascists, there were anarchists, even all these different groups yep. vying for control there in Italy. And so I know he had some difficulties kind of unifying those people and even figuring out who could be trusted not to turn him in or kill him or anything yeah. like that. But yep. quite a lot went on before his, before your father finally dropped into country. So I'll, we'll leave a lot of that honestly to the listeners to read in the Brenner assignment afterwards. But can you go ahead and mention then why was your father assigned to support him and how did he end up getting into country finally after so many efforts? Sure. The elimination of those bridges was a very, very, very high priority. And they had numbers of uh, attacks by aircraft, by bombers flying out of northern Africa to try and take out those bridges. But the geography was such it was just extraordinarily difficult. And there were a lot of losses because the planes would have to come in, in some cases, below, like through a canyon. And the Germans had anti-aircraft literally above where the planes were flying. So they were firing down on the planes coming through the canyons. And my uncle was a navigator in one of those planes. Huh. They... It was essential to get those bridges out, and higher-ups had made the determination it was essential to get those bridges out. 
There was also some thought that high-ranking Nazis were going to be taking shelter in the Alps in a fortified area that they had that would be, that were they to get in there, they would be very, very difficult to get out. And so there's lots of concentration on the Alps. And so it was into this that my dad talked himself into heading up this, the Tacoma Mission Group. They flew in Liberator bombers from Northern Africa into, wait, no, I believe it was from an area that they held in Italy, Southern Italy. They flew into this area about 300 miles. And I, I visited the landing zone when I was in Northern Italy. And I was there at midnight when my father would have been parachuting in. And the drop zone was sort of cut out of an older forest. And it was probably about the size of four to six football fields where there was an open area. And it wasn't a blocked rectangular open area. It was down sort of a, a ridge and then in a little valley area. And so there was some definition to it. And so these guys jumped out of a Liberator bomber that had found this little spot by direct reckoning, by navigating. There's no, no satellite satcom or no GPS or anything else. It was the pilots and the navigators who did it by dead reckoning with, with their compasses. And so they found this spot, and the Partizane had set signal fires in this area. Even though they were surrounded by Germans, they set these signal fires when they heard the, the planes coming. And the parachutists jumped out through a hole in the bottom of the Liberator bomber and then parachuted down to the ground. And I believe there were, it was my dad and two other people that were in his particular flight. They were met there on the ground by about 50 to 60 partisans who were dressed in all manner of stuff, and they also had thrown out some equipment as well. And then they were hustled off into some hiding areas. And they, be they began to organize the partisans. And you're right, there were so many different political persuasions who were, who were united, who had left their politics behind. They were united in their fighting the Germans, but some were still interested in preserving. I mean, this is, this is Italy. They have thousands of years of being at war. And so some were preserving firearms and burying equipment and things like this so that when the Germans left, they would be in a position to fight for their new political cause. So it was an interesting time and interesting to try and manage that kind of an environment where you had people who were not only fighting with you, but also fighting among themselves sometime. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine how they would kind of maintain their, not just their composure, but their grasp of the situation with so many groups, so many disparate groups. And then, you know, this overarching threat, of course, from the actual German soldiers, but there's, there's so much that has to be done and the landscape is incredibly challenging. As you mentioned, sometimes it can be hard to know who to trust, death all around as well. So just a, a very, very tough situation. But your father navigated it in a way that very, very few people could have, I believe. Well, I think you're right about that. You have to understand people who are listening would have to understand that there was this was in December. It was the days immediately after Christmas in 1944 that they parachuted in. And there was snow. It's the mountains. There was snow. There were little tiny roads, and the roads might be mm, kind of clear, but not really like we think of snows being, snow being removed from our roads. And so a lot of times, and they could not walk on, a lot of times they could not walk on the roads simply because the Germans were monitoring that. So they get into villages and they depend on the kindness of the Italians who would take them in and support them. They lived in deserted farmhouses sometimes, but it was, and when you, when they would run 
uh, to get away from the Germans and being, they would be running down ice, icy creeks and icy trails. And when they would hide, they'd hide in little caves, but there's the caves, they had to break ice to get into the caves and then sleep with those at night. I was fortunate enough to visit one cave area where my father and a number of his partisan fighters hid out in when German patrols were looking for them. And the caves were about, they were, this would have been five years ago, the caves were about 100 yards away from the road where the German patrols were looking for my dad and for his Italian fighters. And they were just, they were there, just hmm. 100 yards, 50 yards away. And you could look down. And if the Germans had looked up and had seen, well, we need to look in those caves, they would have been caught. Hmm. So, yeah, it really is hard to imagine. It seems like a scene from a movie. And as an audience member, you'll know that the good guys are going to survive, you know, but they certainly had no way of. They had no way of knowing. That no. Time. And. Your father had many other very, very close brushes with death, as I'm sure we're going to talk about here as well. So, Jack, I did want to ask you, there's a very, quite frankly, a very shocking story in the book about these two Austrian deserters that briefly joined his group. Yes. If you recall, do you mind retelling that story for the listeners? Sure. The Austrian deserters had joined this the partisan group, and they had been kept at arm's length, I think, by the... Italians been used for sort of menial kinds of things, carrying things, just, I mean, just, they weren't part of the fighting crew, is what I'm trying to say. It became, it's my understanding that the unit that these guys had deserted from moved closer into the area that they were at, maybe within 20 miles, something like that. And they'd started to decide that maybe they'd return. They weren't, they, maybe they'd, they'd turn in the partisans and they'd be, they'd be welcomed back into their own unit and they'd be able to go home. And so a source advised my dad that this is, that these Austrians were, were plotting on turning in the, the group to the Germans. And so he told two of his lieutenants in the partisan group, he said, go take care of these guys, get rid of them, and explained what was going on. So the two Italians went into the, the room immediately next door where the Austrians were, and they took with them saps. Now, a sap is like a long leather tube that's been filled with weight, with usually lead of some kind. And so they were going to take care of the Austrians by using these saps. Well, the Austrians did not want to be taken care of, and so they <laughs> fought back. And so my dad is in the room, adjacent room, and he hears all of this commotion. And so dad goes in, and he draws the fighting knife that he had, and he enters the fray, and he just slits the throats of the two Austrians and turns over the bodies to the Italians and says, okay, take care of them, get them out of here. And so that was, I mean, he, he had to fight in a, in a very, very personal way to, to accomplish his mission and to prevent these Austrians from turning in his group and causing great damage. Right, right. Absolutely. It's a, a complex situation of, of which there are so many in, in war, wartime, of course, but he had to weigh these two guys against the lives of everyone there because I'm, I know that there was no way they could really hold out against the Germans for very long if they were truly cornered. No. Because certainly they were outnumbered and all that, you know, but at the same time, these two guys, you know, there was no POW camp to send them to. There were no interrogators to turn them over to or anything like that. It was just a handful of partisans, like you mentioned, and, and your father and his, his knife, yep. essentially. And that's what it came down to. So it sounds like he made a very, very logical, but, you know, kind of cold hearted decision there in the, the midst of that situation. Yeah, there was no, you, the, the group had to be 
extraordinarily mobile. There wasn't like a higher headquarters that they could go to. There wasn't a brig or a jail that these people could be sent to. The, the partisans were fighting on the move and they had to move. They had to move from village to village. They had to move from house to house in the village and they had to move from mountain range to in, from, into caves. They were on the move and they were ordering, they would radio in a location to have equipment dropped or to have supplies dropped, but they were absolutely on the move and there was no way for them to set up a stockade, for instance. And these guys had lived with the, with the partisans and were gonna turn them in, so their hearts were not pure. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, there's, I mean, there was, they kind of took all the choices away from the partisans in a real sense, yeah. you know, but it was, it was tough to put myself in their shoes, honestly, and know what has to be done and then, and then kind of follow through with it. That time, these guys that they had been, you know, kind of metaphorically breaking bread with, you know, gotten to know, certainly probably knew some of their life story, that sort of thing. thing. And then, you know, was, everything turns around in the space of a few minutes, potentially. Yep. So the group, you said they were on the move and they were fighting. They were involved in many, many engagements with the Germans, it sounds like. And they seem to have conducted quite a few successful attacks and, you know, blew up several bridges, that sort of thing. I mean, was it, it seemed like a very close run thing throughout. How, how often would you say that your father was involved in actual direct fighting during his time on the ground in Italy? Well, it's difficult to say. But I would say that his life was in danger 24 hours a day during the time that he was there because you didn't know whether somebody was going to turn you in, whether someone was going to chance upon you hiding in their barn and turn you in, whether a prisoner who had been taken by the Germans would, under torture, tell about your mission and where you were and where you were going to go. And so... For the time that he was there, his he may not have been fighting 24 hours a day, but he was fighting to stay alive 24 hours a day. And mm -hmm. it was, I think, so much of our perception is shaped by things like Hollywood and and television and, and such that it's difficult for us to imagine what that circumstance would be like. There's no intermission. There's no time for commercial yeah. breaks. It's just absolutely, you're, absolutely. You know, during the time that you're there, your life is on at risk. I I, I totally agree. I I cannot truly you know imagine what it's like. I think I can, but I can't actually. Months at a time, never know when they will come, and you know, especially for them involved in these engagements. And and what's more, from reading the book, it seems like they actually were caught two separate times, I believe, and managed to escape by the, just like the thinnest of margins, really. Do you recall the circumstances of those? Well, my dad was captured once and he'd been injured. And so he was being guarded by one, one guard and the guard got too close to him. And so my father who had taught combat hand-to-hand -hand combat as part of his training, grabbed him and broke his neck and threw him to the ground. And so he then got away from that guard, but he was recaptured and he managed to, and he was given a, a crutch because he was injured, or was given a stick with a little pad underneath it to act as a crutch. And so the German lieutenant or the German Nazi lieutenant got too close to my father and dad used the crutch to kill him and escape. So he managed to hide out then and, and rejoin his men later. Hmm. Incredible stuff. I mean, we, these three stories that we've told of your father, his, his knife, his bare hands and a improvised crutch. And all of those were all that he needed really in these close in circumstances like that. Did, did reading this book or did, you know, learning these stories over time as you did, did that kind of change your perception of, you know, the father that you grew up with in any way, learning about the things that he did during the war? 
Well, I don't know. I'm as a kid, I was used to dad coming home when he'd come home from the office and he'd lay his 45 automatic on the door on the table next to the doorway when he took it out of his belt and after he got home. So, no, I don't think he changed my opinion of him. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you were kind of exposed to that level of danger that he was in from a very early age, so that probably helped quite a bit. I'm sure that even if he didn't talk about it very much, I'm sure you could kind of sense the how capable he was in defending himself and taking care of himself in those kind of circumstances. Yes. So eventually, I know that he was supposed to meet up with this Captain Hall on the ground. Was he ever able to actually link up with Hall in any way? I'm just not sure. I don't know. I would have to get into the book. And it's the sort of thing that I don't want to misspeak about. Right, right, right. I understand totally. Yeah, I know that Hall was eventually captured by the, I guess it was the Gestapo agents who were hunting for him. Yep. And, you know, unfortunately, his his story ends pretty tragically there on the ground in northern Italy. He was interrogated quite a bit. And according to Patrick O'Donnell's research anyway, and it's not totally known, I guess, how much information he gave up or whether he broke or not earn, under that interrogation. But eventually they decided that rather than put him into a POW camp or a prisoner exchange or anything like that, they decided to kill him and make it look like he had committed suicide in his cell. So they, they strung him up, you know, using like a metal bar and some twine and something like that and stayed there to make sure that he did pass away. And then they kind of made the scene look like it was a suicide intentionally and then pretended to discover him the next morning, yeah. I believe. So very, very unfortunate end for Hall. They are way beyond his ability to escape from, unfortunately, but... I know that your father had his hands full, to say the least, with everything that he was already doing. So if I recall correctly, they did not meet up because Hall had been captured already by the time that your father got close. Right. Well, there were numbers of OSS agents and operative, operators who were captured and were summarily killed by the Germans. And we mentioned a little bit about the the memorial at Arlington Cemetery, recognizing those who were killed in war and fighting for their country. But there was a, a little pamphlet that talked about, I was I believe it was five or six OSS operatives who were captured and some were sent to prison camps, but they were summarily executed at the camps. There are other instances. And I think that the guys who signed up for this knew that that could be their fate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some incredibly brave guys to sign up for that kind of thing, because like we mentioned earlier, it's not, you know, a mass unit action where you're surrounded by your teammates and you have a tremendous amount of logistical support and that sort of thing behind you. It's, you know, guys that went in in the tiniest of groups with the most dangerous missions and plenty of people signed up for that even probably knowing just full well the danger that lay in wait for them. And a lot of them certainly pay for it with their lives. Yep. So do you know much about what your father did as things were winding down? Because like you said, December 1944, we know now that the war was only a few months away from its conclusion, at least in Europe there. I think it was April that they finally surrendered. So what did your father do in kind of like the last days of the war and kind of like the early portion after the surrender? I believe that, well, he left the army. He did not, like most of the guys who were in at that time, they weren't planning on making a career of the military. I believe that he had, had hoped that the OSS would continue as a spy agency for America, but of course it didn't. And so after his discharge, well, he was... He was still in the army. I do have some photographs of, of the folks on their wedding day, and he was wearing his uniform, and he had a lot of army guys with him as he was leaving the church, and they were throwing bouquets and things like that at the, at the new couple. So they were married in June of 45, so he was 
he immediately went from from the the angst and anger and the danger of war to a married life in June of 1945 and I came along in July of 1946. Hmm. Are, you, are you the the oldest son? I am. Yes. Oh well. Starting a whole new chapter in life there, huh? Yes. For him. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. So do you feel like he was able to put all of this stuff behind him? Because, I mean, he was through some very, very, very gut-wrenching situations in many ways. And, of course, he kind of led a, a, a life of action in some ways, it sounds like, after that. But do you think that he just kind of closed the book on that and moved on into this new chapter that we just mentioned afterwards? Well, I can tell you he was a good dad. We when He, he worked a lot and he was gone a lot. But when he was home, I learned how to fix engines by working with him. I mean, like lawnmower engines and other kinds of things. I learned to hunt, whether it was rabbits or birds or other game, and learned a lot. And I think I probably learned some character as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. He's a he seems like a great guy to pass on a lot of character to his children, certainly. Yep. Well, wow. wonderful. He he was quite a guy and I'm very glad that I, you know, was able to meet you. It was essentially pure happenstance that you and I met in person last October as a matter of fact. So I'm very very glad that that happened since it led to me, you know, learning so much of this story that I was not already familiar with and thus getting to talk about it as well. Well, I think it's important for these stories to be part of our American consciousness, because if we forget them, we have to, at our peril, rediscover these things, and we have to make sure that we don't lose them as well. So it's important that we we keep this line to the to history open so that we can see where we have come from and this may provide some guidance as to where we must go. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And organizations like the OSS Society and, you know, people like you, people like Patrick O'Donnell, they have, have all, you know, made an enormous contribution in that way, really. So I'm very glad that I'm able to be a part of that and link up and, and share some of this knowledge with people that wouldn't otherwise hear it, honestly. Well, I'm glad you are, because we do have to keep this in. If we lose it, we lose something that is absolutely irreplaceable. Certainly is. Certainly is. So, Jack, have you been a member of the Society for very long? I myself just joined in, I think, 2021. And then the the dinner event and the ceremony, that was actually my first time out getting out there with the Society, honestly. But I had a wonderful experience. I've been a member since the mid-1980s and started going to some of the dinners at that time. And it was because my dad needed some, at that point, he was comfortable flying and going with another person from California back to DC. So I, I wasn't, I don't mean to say I'm a caretaker, but I was there to help him as he'd become older so that he could continue to do these things with the OSS. Hmm. That must have been quite a scene back in the mid late eighties, that sort of thing, because so many of the members, including your father, were still alive and still able to share those stories and, and reconnect with each other every year, I would imagine. Yep. I remember one, I believe it was in ninety one, actually, where President George Bush, the elder, was the featured speaker. And oh he was an absolute gentleman. And I'm remembered of, or reminded of an instance where just ahead of my dad and I in the receiving line, there was an older gentleman and he was a bootmaker from Texas, I believe it was Plano, Texas. And he had made some presidential boots for President Bush, who by that time was retired. But he presented them to the president as he was walking through the receiving line and aid stepped forward and took the boots and whisked them away. And they, if you've been in receiving lines, you know, you've got to keep moving. So oh, yeah. George Bush was then introduced from the podium to give the, the speech. And he said, there's a special person here in this audience and I'd like to introduce him. He remembered 
the bootmaker's name. He said, I would like you to stand up. And he used the fellow's name. And I don't remember. But and he said, <laughs> and then he reached under the table and he said, and he made these for me. Would everybody give him a round of applause? And it was like, wait, this is the president of the United States who was involved with CIA prior to being president, but he was the president of the United States. And here he is talking and lauding the efforts of a bootmaker from Plano, hmm. Texas. Oh my gosh, what a moment. Yeah. And it's just, and they're that kind, they're that kind of people in the OSS organization. They're just, they're neat. When, when you and I were there this October at the Donovan dinner, there was a table of younger men next to us. And one of the fellows looked to be about 30. He was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And yes, he was yes. as down to earth and nice and gentlemanly as you can possibly imagine. And it was like he was almost embarrassed. Mm -hmm. that people were fucking Yeah, I was him. I was totally shocked yeah. that I'd been sitting, you know, 15 feet away from this guy without realizing it because you know, you read the name tags that everybody's wearing there but I don't necessarily instantly recall everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, from the news articles that were written and that sort of thing, but yeah, I was shocked when he got a round of applause himself that he'd been there the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Yep, it's it's a great organization and I've been in contact with with Charles Pink. He and I also spoke there that day at the ceremony and had some email contact before and since. Actually, just a couple of days ago, he sent me a document that I was trying to find and didn't know where to find it. And within an hour of me emailing him, he sent it right back to me and it was exactly what I was looking for. So and he's the president of the society. So that was a really great feeling. Honestly. He's a great guy. Hey, certainly. He seems like the absolute driving force in every way, because anytime I've reached out or anything, it's been him that has handled everything. So kind of a one man show there is what has been my impression of it. Yes, his father was the society director before, and his father had been an OSS operative, and I'm blanking on exactly what he did, but Charlie stepped in after his father passed to make sure that the society would continue on, and he's done a great job. He's also been a leader in the development of National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations that is planned for the Washington, D.C. area. Things got held up because of COVID and the pandemic and all of that, but I believe that things are, are moving ahead again. But that's another way that we'll be able to cascade forward the history of these amazing men and women. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I have seen the plans, and I know that it's still a ways away from actually opening right now, but very excited. I did a little a little fundraiser online for it last year, and I think I ended up donating close to a thousand dollars. I think, which was you know, hopefully that money will be put to good use soon, and people will get to see a lot more about these stories. You know, people that don't listen to the podcast or or read the books, but will be able to visit the site at least. Yep, we've got to capture this history, lest it be lost. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jack, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your time. I know that you said that you've done quite a bit of writing in the past. Is there anywhere? like online that people can find your writing right now if they want to look it up after this? Actually, no. I've written everything from articles about magicians to just, you know, I was a freelance writer for some of the newspaper, for some of the magazines in the Los Angeles and then Las Vegas area after I left the uh, University of California. So pretty much hit or miss. You know, I don't have a, a vast I don't have my own website. Perhaps I should. Ah, okay. Okay, I've got you. Yeah, it was actually kind of hard to find much about you, so I'm very glad that we met in person to begin with, honestly, because otherwise this might not have happened. Well, I'm glad it did. Definitely, definitely. So for the listeners, the book that you want to read is The Brenner Assignment by Patrick O'Donnell. We've, honestly, we've barely scratched the surface of the book here because it's so in-depth, so detailed about Captain Hall and Captain Chapel and their amazing stories, as well as the... Gestapo and the SS people that were arrayed against them and the partisans who were with them and some of their fellow teammates from the OSS and even some of the civilians caught up in the midst of everything there in Italy. So it's quite a story. It really, really held my attention. And I really encourage you to pick that up after you finish this episode.
Jack, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, and the other book you mentioned it was, is it Strength of the Wolf? Wolf is about your father's yes. narcotics career? Yes. Strength of the Wolf. Okay, I'm going to definitely have to look for that okay. one after this. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack. I'll, uh, hopefully I'll see you next October at the dinner. Okay. Again. And thank you very much. All right. Take care. You too. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.